Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. We can think of V1 as a hub or a gateway to other more complex um, visual processes. Around the striate cortex, there's a number of regions that are called the extra striate cortex. And these tend to be at least semi-specialized for processing different kinds of uh, visual stimuli. So for instance, area V4 is seen as being specialized uh, for colors and area V5 also known as MT, tends to be specialised for processing motion. So if we take a very simple um, brain imaging experiment, if you compare uh, coloured images of, or coloured squares against their grayscale equivalents, and you subtract the grayscale activity from the colour activity, you find um, this region uh, V4 is responding primarily to the colour over the grayscale. Whereas if you have uh, moving dots, compared with static dots, we find that an area called V5 or MT is responding to moving over static. V1 on the other hand is um, active by all of these conditions, so colour, grayscale, moving and static. So when you subtract out these particular pairs, it looks like V1 isn't interested in them. That's not true. V1 is interested in all of these things, uh, but it's not more interested in one relative to the others. So you don't get this particular uh, pattern if your stimuli are suitably matched. There are also regions such as LOC, which is involved in uh, shape processing. That's the lateral occipital complex, and we'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so why would you have, for instance, specialist uh, regions for processing uh, colour and motion, given that colour and motion is already there at the, the retina, and it's already there to some extent in V1? The reason it's important is that what we're trying to do in these higher order regions is to actually group together different parts of space uh, according to how things are structured. So remember the um, neurons in V1 have relatively small receptive fields. They respond only to uh, particular uh, points in space that, that are relatively narrow. In V4, for instance, they have larger receptive fields, so they respond to large areas of illumination. And this is important for grouping things together by colour. It's also important for something called colour constancy. And what this means is detecting what the colour of something is, irrespective of whether it's lit in bright light or dim light or yellowy light or blue light. So as um, the sun sets throughout the day, uh, the, the colours change from being bluish, yellowish to bluish, for instance, uh, during the day. And the brain somehow compensates and adjusts for this. There was a viral phenomenon called the dress where the, uh, the colours were entirely uh, ambiguous. Um, some people see them as uh, gold and other people see them as uh, black, for instance. And the way that this works is because the, the dress is cropped, it's ambiguous as to what the lighting condition is. is we are unable to infer the colour because we cannot see uh, the, the light source. So what V4 normally does is that it tries to figure out what the colour of an object is by discounting the light source, discounting whether it's yellowy light or blue light, uh, and so on, to figure out what the true colour is. So it's doing something that V1 and the retina cannot do by virtue of having this wider information about uh, how the whole visual scene is illuminated rather than what the colour is at any particular uh, point in it. If you damage um, your area V4, which is located in both the left and the right hemisphere, for, for both the left and right visual field, then you are not blind, but you have a, uh, a remarkable symptom called achromatopsia, where the world appears to be black and white. You've literally lost your experiences of colour and you're unable to, uh, to discriminate uh, most colours. It's very different from being uh, retinally colourblind, where you're losing or have an aberrant colour receptor in the eye. So cerebral achromatopsia is seeing the world in black and white, or if you only damage one of your V4s, you might see half of the world in black and white.
V5, on the other hand, is um, responding to uh, visual motion, which we see in single cell recordings, or we see in imaging experiments, for instance, when we compare moving dots against static dots. If you damage your V5, again, you would not become uh, blind as such, but you would have impaired vision. In particular, you would be poor at detecting visual motion. So what patients who have damage to V5 do, and these patients are called akinotopsic, they um, might report seeing the world as a series of snapshots. So they would see, rather like in stroboscopic light, they would see a series of snapshots from which they could infer that something is moving, but they would not see movement in the way that most people uh, understand it. So although these regions V4 and V5 are specialised for particular aspects of vision, they don't only um, process colour. So for instance, V4 is also important for certain other aspects of vision, uh, including, for instance, certain shape detection. Uh, but, but it does have a particular importance in colour. But it's also not the only region that processes colour. Uh, so for instance, if you show an image of a, a red tomato, uh, versus a blue tomato, for instance, other regions of the brain would be interested in that uh, anomalous colour. So, for instance, uh, the hippocampus, which is a memory store, in this case, would be interested in the anomalous colour because it says, hang on, this is not how the world should be. So V5 doesn't necessarily uh, store those particular object colour associations. And similarly for motion, although uh, V5 is very important for motion, there are other regions of the brain that are motion responsive. So for instance, other uh, regions of the brain are involved in detecting whether or not uh, a moving pattern of lights um, represents a human versus a non-human. And patients with akinotopsia, patients with akinotopsia can also tell from patterns of light whether somebody is human or non-human, despite having other problems in motion. So again, these regions are important for certain aspects of uh, vision, but they are not the only parts of the brain that are important for us. One region of the brain that's important for early shape processing is called LOC, or the lateral occipital complex. This region responds to being shown um, objects more than textures, or for instance, an image of an object that's been jumbled up, so it's got the same raw visual information, but is not representing uh, an object. It does respond the same to both real and made up objects though, so it's not a memory store of objects, it's, um, it's still involved in visual processing rather than object memory. One way of studying what uh, a region such as LOC actually does, what kind of information it carries, is to look at bold adaptation. So the bold response is the standard signal you get from fMRI. And if you present the same stimulus twice, what you find is that the bold response is lower on the second occasion. And this is called adaptation or priming. So we can use this to see what the response properties are of certain brain regions. So for instance, if I present an image of a bird uh, to, um, to the brain and look at the activity in LOC, and then I present exactly the same image of the bird, we would find that, um, that the response uh, would go down on the second time. It's adapted to that. But if we have an image of a bird and then a different image of a bird, so for instance, a bird in flight versus a bird perched, then LOC would not adapt. So it's treating these as two different things, even though somewhere in the brain, we would recognize these as being the same object. LOC isn't doing that because the shape has changed. So it's sensitive to these changes in shape, uh, but it doesn't care about things like size. So if we make an object bigger or smaller, it would still recognize them as the, uh, the same. So if we have uh, uh, the same image of a bird big and the same image of a bird small, it would still adapt to that. It would recognize the second image as being the same as the first, even though they're different in size. And it would still do the same thing if part of the, the image, uh, for instance, of the bird was occluded. So if you cover some of it up. So here we could say that because it's treating uh, it the same, it's showing the same adaptation profile as if we repeat the same identical image, that the brain is kind of filling in the missing bird. It's still treating it uh, as a whole uh, here with the occlusion. So it clearly has some information about depth uh, 
and about what is in front and what is behind. So all of these uh, regions of the brain are going to be important for things like recognising objects, but they're still relatively primitive. They're not coding for, for instance, knowing exactly what a banana is, and they're not coding things at a high um, level in terms of memory of objects or being able to act on objects. So what we find out of these early visual processes is that the brain branches out into various routes, uh, which are typically called the ventral stream and the dorsal stream, that have different functions. One is determining what an object is, and another route, the dorsal stream, is determining where an object is and enabling actions on objects, a kind of hand-eye coordination, one way of uh, describing what the dorsal stream does. And we will cover that in other bite-sized tutorials.